Good morning, everyone. My name is James Cameron, and I have had the pleasure of chairing the ODI board for almost eight years now. As many of you know, ODI is a global independent think tank that harnesses the power of research, evidence, and ideas to confront challenges, develop solutions, and bring about purposeful change. ODI is delighted to be convening today's discussion on a stronger, greener recovery during New York Climate Week and the 75th anniversary of the UN General Assembly. It's a topic that's important to me, having spent much of my legal career working on climate change matters, including negotiating the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change all the way, all the way back to the very beginning in the late 80s and leading up to 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio, and then the Kyoto Protocol in 97, and many years after that, too, on behalf of the Alliance of Small Island States, and more recently advising the presidencies of Morocco and Fiji. It's also a really important year for ODI as we reflect on 60 years of conducting research and providing advice and solutions to, to some of the world's most intractable problems. And now because of COVID, we have opportunity to really rethink how it is that we want to rebuild our economies and what efforts need to be expended both by governments and entrepreneurs and business builders, something I've also done in my working life, trying to find ways of building enterprises uh, that can deploy resources, human technological capital resources, uh, to building a better and more resilient future. And nowhere is this more significant than, than dealing with, with climate change. The climate crisis, you may have heard Prince Charles yesterday at the opening of uh, of Climate Week in New York, is challenging human society in so many ways. You know, according to the best scientific evidence, the world really has very little time to deliver drastic greenhouse gas emission reductions and stem the loss in biodiversity, or we will lose the chance that we do still have of addressing this problem successfully and building a better future. So while policymakers wrestle with the challenges of COVID-19 and economic recovery, the climate emergency persists and it can't be put on hold. We have to bring these two great challenges to our society together and find intelligent ways of responding. Back in July, ODI's Global Reset Dialogue set global leaders a difficult challenge in the area of climate change. They had to highlight the urgency of climate action while helping to navigate the competing visions of a green future, as well as the complex choices and trade-offs facing policymakers as they respond to the significant economic impact of the pandemic. Today, we want to explore some of those ideas in more detail with our panel by asking what level of ambition exists for this green recovery? And how can we ensure that this level of ambition becomes a reality? There are now good examples from all over the world. All sorts of jurisdictions are building compelling and sometimes substantial plans to respond to COVID-19 and in a green way. I mean, it's a euphemism, it's a, it's a simple way of putting it, but some of the uh, suggestions that are emerging from countries are really quite striking and large in scale. We want to explore how those are emerging and, 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 and critically analyze them. We have a wonderful lineup for you today. I hope you'll see that already and, and, and here in due course. First of all, from Inga Anderson, the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program. Ms. Anderson brings a passion for conservation and sustainable development with more than 30 years of experience in international development economics environmental sustainability and policy making, as well as in designing and implementing projects and generating on the ground impact. We're also joined by Alhamdu Dorsuma, Manager for Climate and Green Growth Division within the African Development Bank. He's responsible for leading the bank's efforts on climate change in Africa, including building climate resilience and low carbon opportunities into, banks, into the bank's investments and supporting the bank's engagement on climate resilience and green growth. And finally, we hear from Madhav Dat, founder of Green the Gene. Madhav founded Green the Gene as a small environmental club in school when he was eight years old. 
Since then, he scaled the organization to one of the world's largest completely youth-run environmental nonprofits with projects in 62 countries and over 7,000 volunteers. We will have opportunity for audience Q&A, so please post your questions in the event chat box. Um, ODI people will moderate that and hopefully draw things to my attention. I'm sorry if I miss things immediately, but I'll, I'll be watching. Uh, and then now we'll go into uh, brief six minute presentations uh, and, and then we'll try and bring it all to some kind of interesting conclusion at the end. So let's begin uh, with, with Inga, please. Thank you very much, James, and thanks to everyone at ODI and congratulations on your anniversary. Um, we are here talking about something that probably everyone is talking about right now, COVID-19 and how we're going to use this absolutely terrible occurrence to the best of the advantage that we can, because we need to understand that um, the global pandemic is essentially a message from nature. And it's a loud and clear message. It's, a, it's, it's essentially caused by our continued unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. And that is something that has eroded wildlife, eroded nature, and, and eroded uh, nature's ability to uh, maintain risk and therefore run over into zoonosis and zoonotic diseases. I mentioned this because the climate crisis needs to be seen with its two twins, or so it's a triple crisis we're talking about climate crisis, nature crisis, and pollution and waste crisis. These three uh, are all caused by the same phenomenon, our unsustainable production and consumption. And obviously with COVID hitting us so very hard, we've seen no one is spared. The labor markets, the job losses, the kids in, out of school, uh, the informal workers being the hardest hit, et cetera. So here comes the stimulus package. And that stimulus package we then have some conversations to do around it, because where does it go? Um, and, and the global response to stimulus has been overwhelming, about $15 billion from our own taxpayers' money shot into the economy. This should not happen normally, and it's very good that it did, but where does the money go? And that's a conversation that we need to have. Now, as you rightly said, James, there have been some good examples, and I'm sure we'll hear more about these, inside and outside of Europe. But obviously, the European Green Deal is a very big piece uh, to take note on. We need to understand that that money, these 15 billion, uh, as well as whatever else is slushing around the economy, it is small monies compared to what will need to happen if we do not take climate action, if we do not take nature action, if we do not take pollution and waste action. And so therefore, if we do not deal with our unsustainable production and consumption. Now, the most vulnerable countries have actually woken up to the climate crisis the very first. There are some 106 countries who are committed to enhanced NDC, national determined contribution submissions in 2020. But we also need to be the hard truth. We need to be very honest. These 106 countries only amount for 17.8% of total global emissions. So for the G20 countries and other large emitters, there is a to-do item here, and that is called join the growing movement, set ambitious and stretched NDCs, and use the stimulus package, because the other hard truth is that most of the stimulus is from wealthy countries to wealthy countries, um, and that is clearly an issue. I'm told to switch on my camera, but my camera is on, so I will continue. Um, now, the point here is that job creation um, is much better driven uh, by investments in renewables, for example. In the US, if you invest $1 million into oil and gas, uh, it's calculated you create about five jobs. You put that money into energy saving, re building retrofits, you create 22 jobs, um, um, 13 for wind um, and 14 for solar, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, if this is about job creation and not climate change, put your money into renewables. But also we need to think about how climate change can be of help towards preventing the next pandemic. How do I get that? Because we need to understand that deforestation, which is a biodiversity, obviously causing biodiversity loss and nature loss, 
if we replant, restore, regenerate our forests and our ecosystems, we will protect on resilience uh, and on adaptation, but we will most certainly also deal with carbon storage. So investing in green and green infrastructure, uh, nature's infrastructure will also be part and parcel of the solution. I referred to the Green Deal, but it should also be mentioned South Korea has taken very positive steps and uh, financed both the pandemic, but also set very high ambition, uh, for example, on a net zero emissions goal, shifting away from finance and coal uh, towards renewable energy. In Indonesia, we are seeing the ministry has launched the low carbon development report in early 19 that they are now rolling out and looking at 15 million new jobs uh, by uh, in, in some 15 years or so. So this high ambition alliance, this high ambition dimension to the NDCs, the national determined contributions, um, will require very smart fiscal buy-in and very smart fiscal policy and very smart buy-in from the private sector. The MDBs are stepping up and have done a fair bit. And the G20 uh, debt relief is critical in this regard. I mentioned that uh, rich countries have provided monies to their own economies. Um, MDBs, as well as the G20 debt relief, has been significant to provide uh, stimulus packages to uh, the developed world. But interestingly enough, few countries have taken advantage of the debt service suspension that was endorsed by the G20, probably because they're afraid of how it might look to markets and rating agencies. So we need to square that circle and ensure that um, that advantage can indeed be taken. And unfortunately, private sector lenders have not stepped in and have not offered meaningful forbearance on their own and thereby undercutting government's efforts. And this is something that we need to have a conversation about. So on the whole, then, um, we have some real opportunities with the stimulus package. And as I mentioned, some countries have done right, but many other countries are yet to make that move. And so we need to all stimulus must have sort of green nudges and we should not be uh, providing stimulus unless countries or companies will shift towards green. We should invest in green R&D for job creation, etc. I'm aware that I'm at 30 seconds over, so I will stop right now. The strong uh, call here is obviously for building back better and I very much look forward to this conversation. Back over to you, James. Inga, no, it's a very thank you very much for, for for staying within your time too. Now, the what is your sense this year? Have has has ambition increased? Do you see it in the NDCs that are emerging so far? Could you see some connection between the NDCs emerging for the COP twenty six postponed negotiations and the stimulus packages? Are there some good examples there? You mentioned the EU and Korea, but what's your sense just on what you see passing through the intergovernmental process? Are, are, are we raising ambition or have we really got to step it up before the next, uh, before COP26? Oh, itself? we really got to step it up. Uh, we're not raising ambition. The right, the right countries are not raising ambition, not that they're wrong countries, but I think you understand the countries with the biggest carbon load have to stretch much, much more. And these are the same countries that have taken stimulus monies from their own taxpayers, obviously, and put them into the economy. Huge resources. So the opportunity is there right now. And that opportunity will not come again, not in generations, we hope, because we hope that we will not have more pandemics or more catastrophes of this kind. So this is a once in a lifetime, once in a century, I hope, uh, opportunity. Don't waste it. So, no, we are not there. These 116 countries that have stepped up and stretched their NDCs, they're the small islands, they are low-lying economies, they are only representing 17.8% of the global carbon emissions. So, uh, G20, there is a, there is a to-do item here. And this is very real. And the interesting part about COVID is, of course, that we listen to science. We understood that what science was telling us was pretty important, wear a mask, wash your hands, stay at home, et cetera, to, uh, to reduce the spread. Uh, well, climate science has been around for some 30 years and it has been consistent in its messaging. Uh, so it's high time to listen to science. We're already seeing um, um, that where we are on the trajectory that we are now, 
in terms of our carbon emissions. We're not going down. We're not going where we should be. And we're not at all aligned with Paris. Uh, but when we combine it then with the nature crisis, and I would add the pollution and waste crisis, but for, nature, for the nature crisis, making sure that we understand that protecting of our forests, protecting of our ecosystem is critical, both for our own protection, but also for carbon reduction. And ensuring that things like food waste, uh, which if it were a country would be the third largest emitter of, of greenhouse gases, that food waste is part and parcel of the NDCs. You need to take the entire rainbow. And so that's where we need to go. That's a strong point, isn't it? We, the, the entire rainbow is exactly the right way to, to see this. And there is a temptation, particularly amongst uh, politicians that have constituencies that they want to serve that are in the incumbency who, who are already in positions of power and influence uh, to, to use stimulus packages to look after them and, 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 and the jobs and the economic prospects that they have and not sufficiently focus, as you have set out, on the greater number of jobs that may be available in, in the green recovery. So it seems to me that we, one of the things we must do is to present a a, a range of opportunities for stimulus money to deliver climate outcomes that do not trade off the present against the future. Uh, and uh, it would be good in this conversation to have a think of some more positive examples of how that can be done and, and therefore encourage uh, greater ambition in this next um, 18 months or so. Anyway, let me let me move on now to um, to Alhamdu and uh, and the African continent and the African Development Bank and the things that you're doing there. So uh, over to you. You better just, there's something going wrong there. So Madhav, I hope you're ready. <laughs> you can step in and help us out here by making your presentation and we'll sort out what's going on in the Ivory Coast. So thank you. Um, I, my experience here is, uh, you know, sort of different from uh, the intergovernmental side of things and more focused on sort of on ground uh, innovations for technology. Uh, as uh, James briefly mentioned, um, I founded Green the Gene as this very small environmental nonprofit uh, back when I was eight years old. And we, we started extremely simple. Uh, we like planted six trees right, right outside our schoolyard, you know, tried to convince local shopkeepers not to use plastic bags. Um, and then over the years, uh, gradually and slowly grew quite a bit. Um, in this process, uh, we realized something very interesting. So along the way, I realized that while you know any large scale climate change challenge uh, would need you know significant partnerships, multi stakeholder interventions that not just you know involve uh, like robust policy initiatives, but also collaborations and initiatives from bodies like the UN Environment Program, private sector interventions, and whatnot. Uh, but in this process. There are a lot of communities who live in very live in a state of acute climate crisis. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, for instance, there are uh, lo lots of communities across the world who don't have access to safe and usable water. Um, you know, whose water access is affected by things such as uh, plastic pollution um, and whatnot. There are lots of people who are uh, consistently forcibly displaced. And while there are a lot of I initiatives that are aimed at improving. Uh, and helping the situations that they're facing, uh, the sort of impact of those initiatives is usually seen uh, many years or e e like even in very ambitious cases, many months out away from when they're intended and when they're implemented. And in, in the meanwhile, uh, these communities are essentially forced to, you know, live in, in survival mode. And which this, this sort of realization um, essentially pushed me to you know take green the gene from you know our focus to uh, developing extremely simple yet very technology and data in intensive solutions tailored to address extremely specific problems that are faced by local communities across the world. Uh, so we leverage a lot of low cost technologies and uh, try and build these sort of uh, very localized solutions that can help people solve their problem in the immediate sense while uh, you know, while more robust solutions, while longer term solutions to the underlying root cause problem, you know, can come into effect.
And I think the uh, the sort of uh, we're completely youth led and youth driven, which allows us to uh, you know like so. I, I fundamentally believe that our generation and young people are the most affected by climate change, and so it is really important that young people um, step up um, and sorry, so that so that young people step up, take charge, and actually drive innovation and action uh, that you know hel helps us build solutions to this problem. Um, so you know the, the two sort of areas where uh, we focus on why uh, trying to get young people involved in directly in these very low cost technology innovation based interventions and bringing them directly to communities is um, sort of the perspective that I wanted to um, share here. That's, that's brilliant. Uh... I do see huge opportunity in the youth movement and not just in a sort of political mobilization sense, but in the finding of solutions that can be adopted in a, in a consumer context, in, a, in, a, in an enterprise context too. Um, I'd like to hear just a, in the limited time we've got a little bit more, Madhav, about the sort of projects that you've been developing, including in, in Tanzania, there's some really interesting stuff there that could, that could and should be shared with the, with the audience we've got. I'd love to do that. Um, so there's a little bit of a story. I um, uh, back back when I was working on you know recycling project, um, I happened to meet Busara. Now uh, she was a 15 year old girl from a small rural community in Tanzania. Um, I mean she was just you know maybe slightly younger than me at that time. And during the day, she worked with her parents uh, planting rice. But then after a day of hard labor, she had to walk over seven kilometers to the nearest source of safe and usable water and then walk all the way back with a 15 kilogram jerry can on her head. And this was this this was not this isn't really a one off story. This is a reality for, you know, almost 800 million people from across the world who are forced to live in this state of acute environmental crisis because of a lack of access to safe and usable water. So what uh, we did at Clean the Gene was develop uh, these portable point of use water purification devices. These are designed to be extremely low cost. We used a lot of advanced tech here. We tried to bring in um, you know, solutions such as UV LEDs, series of mechanical meshes, et cetera, to filter out contaminants. And each of these devices um, costs less than $8 to build is completely energy self-sufficient and so can be deployed in areas which don't have access to electricity. And uh, we leverage a lot of on-device sensors and you know applied artificial intelligence to ensure that the water was in fact free from co contaminants and was actually usable. And over the last year, we've deployed, uh, over the last two years, uh, we've deployed 8,000 of these units in uh, three rural regions in Tanzania. Um, and have been able to bring safe and usable water to about 40,000 people. Um, so we realized that with this technology, we've filtered about 14.4 million liters of water, but also we've saved like, so this, this essentially a simple low cost intervention like this uh, allowed women from those communities to save a cumulative of about 15,000 hours of walking every day. So that's a little bit about, uh, you know, just, just how uh, impact from simple technology-based interventions can really, really um, scale and reach. Companies. Brilliant example, and, and one that you one hopes can be replicated in many parts of the world. Um, I think we're going to try and go back to Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Alhamdu, are you are you ready now? Do you think you're? you're yes, I am. Up? Great, perfect. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity given to us to share our perspectives on this very important topic on building back stronger and greener uh, from COVID-19. Um, as your question is really right, uh, you know, what level of, um, of ambition on climate change or climate action and sustainability uh, we aim uh, while we are moving to COP26 uh, next year in this current context of COVID. Uh, as you may know, uh, similar to other uh, regions in the world, Africa has been significantly affected by the impacts of uh, COVID. Uh, just one example from the recent African Economic Outlook report of the African Development Bank that shows that 
Africa's GDP is uh, going down, has been gone, has gone down uh, due to COVID-19, uh, ranging from uh, loss of USD 100, 145 million to 190 billion, sorry. Uh, so uh, it's uh, this from the pre-COVID estimation of about uh, 2.6 trillion US dollars. So it shows you that um, Africa's economies have been really affected by, by this situation. And the situation poses uh, a significant risk that uh, most of the limited financial and technical um, resources in Africa uh, will be diverted to address COVID-19, while countries are already uh, facing other kind of vulnerability, including climate vulnerability. Uh, because at the same time uh, COVID is taking place, uh, climate impacts are also happening. Uh, for instance, currently, as we speak now, in East and West Africa, uh, more than 12 countries have are being affected by flooding. Uh, it is estimated that um, 1.2 million people are losing their homes and their livelihoods in 12 different countries. And uh, one on, on, another example is Sudan. You know, Sudan, following the El Nino flooding, um, Sudan has declared a three-month, uh, you know, state of emergency because of the flooding. Uh, so it shows you that um, COVID is going on. We are fixing it, but then we need also to fix other crises, in particular as a climate crisis. That's the reason why uh, we uh, uh, there is a, list, a lesson that we can learn from this situation is that we need uh, we need a more a, a multi-dimensional and integrated response to to the uh, multifaceted crisis that countries are are, are facing with. Uh, if you have to move towards immediate and um, long-term recovery from this uh, situation um at the at the level of the african development bank given that we are a development institution in the continent uh we are very um, conscious that we need to uh, take measures to respond to the covid 19 um but these measures should enable the continent especially africa to transition to a greener and more resilient and better society uh, because uh, we should not go to we should not go back to normal because normal was exactly the reason behind the existing vulnerabilities uh, we are facing including the climate vulnerability uh, so we need to increase the level of ambition for climate action and sustainability um, and uh, these ambitions have to be very high and um, the covid situation uh, should not divert us from having ambitions for climate. Uh, for this end, uh, uh, for at the African Development Bank, of course, in the context of COVID, we have put together um, a package of uh, 10 billion US dollars to address COVID. But in that package, we uh, are included some specific measures to help countries really uh, uh, transition to a greener recovery. Uh, because for us, uh, uh, although economies have been affected, but in recovering, we need to bear in mind uh, that sustainability is very important. So one example is that we included uh, in our, our result measurement framework for COVID-19 projects, the specific measures and indicators to, 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 to mainstream uh, climate actions into COVID response. Um, in order to build the resilience and also contribute to uh, uh, less uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we are really uh, working on building back better on a, on a building back better approach in the context of COVID. For instance, we have uh, in the agriculture sector a specific strategy we call Feed Africa strategy. And in that strategy, we included uh, a, a program uh, after COVID that we call Feed Africa response to COVID farming. And this program paves the way to build resilience and sustainability in, and also self-sufficiency in food systems in the project that we are having in Africa in order to help farmers cope with COVID and also ensure that uh, uh, farmers could, could also take opportunities of uh, climate smart agriculture technologies to, to transition to a greener uh, agricultural systems.
Um, and in the energy sector, for instance, in some of the projects we have had in Africa, we include some specific renewable energy solutions for countries, for instance, to put in place some, um, some what we call a, a solar system for, for health, health facilities so that the uh, you know, health system can use uh, uh, renewable energy technologies in their, in their system. Uh, so uh, in the African Development Bank also, uh, we are now in, in order to raise ambition we are developing a new um, climate change and green growth policy, a strategy and action plan in order to, 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 to take lessons from COVID and also to, to move towards more climate actions in Africa with four key area of areas of focus. One being that we are going to align our investment on the Paris Agreement. We are going to foster just transition also uh, uh, accelerate adaptation because adaptation is Africa's priority on climate change, as well as scaling up uh, uh, mitigation actions uh, and mobilize climate final resources for the continent. And uh, uh, we are also working with the other African institutions to develop the Africa Green Stimulus Package to ensure that from we build back from COVID in, in a greener uh, manner for Africa to cope with both COVID and the climate crisis. There are opportunities to do that, to achieve um, uh, ambition. One of them being that in investing in climate action uh, makes economic sense. Uh, this is not from me, but it is a, 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 a finding from the recent uh, adaptation report from the Global Commission Adaptation that shows that uh, the adaptation, investing adaptation comes with high returns, uh, high uh, you know, uh, uh, benefit cost ratio and also more jobs uh, for, uh, with the dollars spent to, to adaptation. So opportunities are there. Opportunities also exist because there is an urgency now to build back from, from COVID, but also to address the climate risk at the same time. Uh, so private sector has to come in, uh, we know that. We did a research study in Africa that shows that by 2030, investing in climate action we require uh, a total of three trillion US dollars. And uh, our assessment also shows that from this three trillion, 75% of it are, have to come from private sector and financial industry. So we need to work very closely with the private sector and the financial industry in Africa to make uh, resources available. But uh, private sector is, uh, is not really well capacitated, capacitated enough to take climate action and to respond. So we need to also uh, raise awareness of the private sector, make, make them uh, you know, aware of the fact that they have to also green their own portfolios. They have to assess climate risk into their own portfolios and investments in order to take more actions uh, and, and build a sustainable uh, a society. But there are also barriers, of course. Barriers, as, as I see, is, uh, include, for instance, the existing divergence between developed and developing countries in the context of the climate negotiations. I'm expecting that there will be some tough negotiations uh, before and during COP26 next year on some specific issues, for instance, on finance. We know that uh, Paris Agreement calls for 100 billion US dollars per year by 2020, this year for climate action from developed countries to developing countries. And this is, yet, this is yet to happen. We also know the whole issue about historical responsibility. Most of developing countries are going to insist on that. And uh, for those, I think uh, those barriers have to be, to, to be overcome. And uh, I, uh, all countries are aware of that. Currently, let me finish on that. African countries are revising. Most of them actually are revising their NDCs except two that have developed NDCs before COVID. I think Morocco and Benin, and not that Benin, Rwanda. But um, we need, they have most of, since most of them have not submitted revised and NDCs yet, there is an opportunity for them to take stock of the COVID situation and ensure that their NDC submissions respond to these kind of vulnerabilities and also with the linkages between COVID and, uh, and, and the climate. Uh, so I think uh, countries are aware of that and the uh, African Development Bank is really keen to support countries to move towards 
that, that direction for more climate action, ambitious plans uh, to be submitted ahead of, of, of COP, COP26 next year. Let me stop okay. here and maybe respond to other questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, loads, of good, loads of good material there. Uh, we are getting questions coming in uh, already. So if it's all right by you, I'm just going to have a little check of uh, those that have come through. Uh, there are several. Um, why don't we start with the legendary Simon Maxwell, ODI X leader, uh, who said, who's talked about um, motivate, mobilize and manage uh, the, 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 the themes that emerge from the global reset conversations in ODI. And many emphasize the difficult trade-offs inherent in the managed part, i.e. the fiscal space, but also issues like the need to support those who can be left behind by transition, coal miners, aerospace workers. Uh, we did mention, and uh, Alhamdu mentioned the just transition pro very properly, but we all have to be aware that, that, that what we must do might also cause division and disruption. Uh, the politics of the change are very important and the educational requirements and retraining requirements. I wonder if we could just have a little brief conversation about that transition and how best to manage it. Uh, Inga, let me start. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you very much. I mean, this is obviously the big, the big question, right? Because we, we want to make this transition and we want to do it in the spirit of the SDGs, not, uh, not leaving anyone behind. And we want to do that with a degree of equity at the national, but let me also stress at the, at the global level. Um, last week, a very interesting report came out from the UN Economist Network, and it spoke to these five megatrends, not good, not bad, just big megatrends that are happening in our world right under our noses. Climate change, growing inequality, urbanization, rapid population changes, aging populations in many places, and the opposite in others, and the technological revolution. So all of this together, sort of, unless we understand the interlinkages between these, and unless we understand how they all hang together, and how one, how policy actions in one area can drive something positive or negative in another, that's really what the report holds, uh, holds up. And here, when we want to deal with climate change, it needs an all of government and an all of society approach, right? Because we have to be sure that we understand that what the, the sort of uh, policy shifts that we put into place in one place, say on climate, um, in the stimulus, what does that do? And are we also thinking about the retraining and the re-education that may need to be done? And even location, locationing, are we thinking about locationing new renewables in areas where maybe there may be exit sectors, sectors that are sunset sectors? And so thinking about the bailouts with clear green strings attached, understanding that investments have to have that thorough analysis uh, and, and, and basis upon which, um, upon which they're made. And so they can't just be the short -ter termism, my constituency, my term. We have to think broader into 2030, into 2050, and ensuring that loans and grants for green investments are available in those places where they're needed. I mentioned earlier on subsidizing green R&D. It's really, really important. And many times in crisis, you cut back on research, you come back on R&D. This is where we should turn it around because we're putting all that money into the economy. And obviously, obviously, and I see some elements here, using subsidies that are already in place to move into green. There was a question around uh, coal, coal subsidies. I mean, clearly, uh, game over. We don't want coal subsidies. We don't want to subsidize dirty and gray economy. We want to subsidize clean and green. And and I really like what Matt Howe was saying because he's talking about, look, we are the ones that are going to inherit your mess here. So we are the ones that's going to have to lean, lean in. So I think um, that means involvement like Matt Howe is speaking about at the community level. But it also means engaging yourself and having those conversations in schools, in universities, in the voting booth, uh, and in political uh, conversations to ensure, because this is not a right or left, up and down, north and south. This is an issue about one planet and an 
and an absolute interconnectedness and understanding that my actions will affect my neighbor. Finally, on the issue of financing, look, as I said, um, wealthy economies have been very good at subsidizing themselves. Uh, we need to see greater degree of solidarity. The, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has very much called for an inclusive uh, solidarity uh, response uh, to uh, to COVID-19. And it's in our distinct interest to not leave anyone behind at the global level. It's in our distinct interest to ensure that the packages, whether they're export promotions or whether they are aid or whether they are loans uh, for development assistance, that they are seen through the lens of longer term, deeper sustainability. So that's sort of where we need to go. Um, but it does take an all of government uh, and all of society approach. And yes, there will be jobs that are exiting, but we are no longer having jobs under steam engines or on, uh, there are a whole range of jobs that have exited over history and these ones will exit too. But here we have an opportunity because we're putting so much money into the economy to do it the smart way and to do it the right way. Brilliant. And there was a question there that uh, linked uh, to, to you, uh, Madhav, really people excited about that example, wondering uh, how to scale it up and, and whether in that example you gave from Tanzania, there was a, a sign of what could be done uh, in a stimulus package to, you know, to, to transfer sometimes quite modest resources, but for very significant uh, uh, improvement of life. But do you want to just respond to, to that question from Krishna? Sure. Um, so I think uh, to sort of build build solutions like these and build technological interventions on the ground, uh, what we sort of learned uh, just from you know actually trying to do that was it's very important to not come in as an outsider, but to very actively partner with local communities and sort of build these solutions with them. Um, so if if we're able to uh, sort of work very closely with communities who are in fact affected, like in this case, affected by the water crisis. Um, and if, if we're able to sort of work very directly with them, it's possible It's uh, possible to make sure that we're actually solving the right problem, the resources that are being deployed. And, and as uh, James mentioned, they are you know usually fairly modest, uh, but they're being deployed uh, in sort of a very targeted, very pointed manner to uh, sort of, you know, Almost, almost surgically solve uh, or almost surgically try to address that very specific problem uh, that is the most important or the most pressing for for the communities that are in question. Um, so I think that is sort of the uh, key approach that we take here. Uh, and in, in terms of the barriers that we face along the way, is I think um, this this is one of those areas where we really really leverage and lean on private sector partnerships, both in terms of you know support while developing technology. Uh, while building these solutions uh, to support experimentation, testing, trials, and whatnot, uh, but also for you know resources as part of various CSR programs um, to essentially enable us to sort of take this and then actually go on the ground and deploy it and make sure that it can reach uh, people who are affected. So I think that sort of covers the two broad aspects of how we uh, build and scale and get this there. Um, and this sort of ties into uh, another concept that I, I'll briefly mention. It's about uh, the idea of open sourcing innovation. So for example, uh, like if particularly for us, we don't really uh, patent any of this technology. We do, you know, we actively go out and encourage other nonprofits to, you know, reuse this, replicate, modify, and build on top of our work and essentially scale it to areas where we with our limited resources just can't reach. And I think uh, like a similar model of open sourcing innovation could really help um, across the board where, you know, these, uh, ideas and these solutions could be you know taken from one place and replicated in multiple different areas uh, to really really scale out impact i think it's a lovely idea in fact it came up on a call yesterday i had with people trying to figure out what the best metrics were uh, for financial reporting and accounting and whether that space which is now quite crowded with lots of people talking about esg ratings of one kind or another could be improved by more of an open source discussion where people would be freer to volunteer ideas about how to change those vital behaviors. And the other thing from your story and indeed others that presented today 
is the sort of iniquity of waste in the food system, you know, in the in the in the packaging system. There's some wonderful new research out from ODI just on packaging waste and how much could be avoided and saved, partly through innovation, partly through better public policy. And that's something that uh, is both shocking and encouraging because it looks like a problem that could be solved. Um, uh, Hamdi, you, you made some great observations about what the bank is doing uh, and indeed mentioned the just transition work that you are doing. That does seem to be a vital theme. Uh, I recall from the climate negotiations the origins of that concept and one of the ways it evolved was to make the case that we could go further faster if we took people with us who felt threatened and, and vulnerable to the change. Um, is that your experience in Africa? Is the bank feeling more confident that the strategies that are emerging uh, can be used to lift uh, those of, out of poverty and into greater wealth creation, even whilst you deal with uh, the pressing problem of climate change? Thank you, James. I, I, right, I, for, for, for us in the African Development Bank, we are taking the concept of just transition very seriously. Uh, we are hearing from what our member countries are saying. Uh, you know, that's why in my introduction, I mentioned the issue of historical responsibility. Um, so uh, transition has to be gradual. Uh, and uh, the Paris Agreement also recognizes that that the countries have to, especially developing countries, have to gradually uh, uh, transition to, to Paris alignment. Uh, so, but to do, to do that, we, we have to address some barriers. Uh, somebody in the chat has mentioned the political barriers. And this is exactly uh, what we are, we are seeing, you know, and that this uh, touches on the issue of just transition, but also uh, on the issue of stranded assets. Uh, you know, many countries are going to face the risk of stranded assets um, because they will be in the situation where they, are not, they will not be able to, to, to harness some of the natural potentials they have, especially on uh, fossil fuels. Uh, many countries have a lot of reserves of coal or gas or whatever. Um, so, uh, uh, asking them to stop investing in, 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 in these uh, technologies, we need to come up with a strong uh, uh, narrative and justification. Uh, but I think for, for on our side at the bank, what we are doing uh, is to really raise ambition on our side and uh, you know, raise awareness on, you know, in the, on the side of the countries, the client countries and also client uh, uh, private sectors to also, uh, you know, um, look at their, their, their investment with climate lens. Um, and also, especially at country level, uh, making sure that countries you know, uh, include climate actions as one of their priorities. Because what, when you look, we, we, we look at the national development plans of many countries, uh, climate change is not yet a priority. Um, but um, so I, there is, that's why I, I insist on awareness raising uh, to build capacity, to help countries and private companies understand the need to, 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 to consider climate risk and climate opportunities in their investment decisions. So uh, I, I, these are barriers we need to face with. And for us, uh, it takes time. It's, 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 we, we, don't, we don't do that overnight. Uh, we have to work closely with uh, private sector, with governments, to to build that understanding of the fact that we need to have more ambitious climate actions. Therefore, uh, we need to transition towards more uh, cleaner technologies than than the uh, the business as usual uh, technologies. Um, for us at the bank, for instance, we already announced that we are not. We are stopping any uh, consideration of coal investment. Actually, we haven't invested in any coal projects over the last ten years. So this is the way to go. We are we are we are moving towards that that that, that direction. Uh, another important element we need to scalable actions. 
you know, most of the climate project, climate related investments in Africa are, are still at pilot stage. Uh, I think uh, similar to the example in Tanzania, most of those uh, uh, projects or initiatives have to, 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 to scale up. And uh, we, uh, to do that, we need to also make sure that resources, uh, uh, including financial and technical, are in place, as well as implementing implementation uh, arrangements. Um, and I, I want to touch on another important point mentioned by Inga, deforestation. You know, in Africa, the issue is not about energy. I think the focus is, is too much on energy uh, at, at global stage. But in Africa, most of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from uh, uh, deforestation, land use uh, changes, etc. So how can we uh, stop the level of deforestation going on in the continent? to make sure that we limit our emissions. But as many of you know, Africa is responsible for less than 4% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. But most of this, 60, 65% of this is coming from deforestation and the land degradation. So this is an area we need to invest more on, uh, but uh, incidentally, the focus is too much on energy transition, et cetera. But for Africa, deforestation is, a, is a very important. And um, as we are currently developing a program we call Africa Circular, Eco Circular Economy Program, together with some uh, partners, including Finland and uh, et cetera. So this program is going to also address uh, issues related to waste management and uh, moving, uh, you know, mainstreaming uh, circular economy as a development strategy in many, many African countries. Let me also finish by saying that, you know, we have delayed climate action for several decades now, despite, despite the fact that this uh, science shows that you know, climate change is happening. You know, when the financial crisis happened 10 years ago, you know, everybody came with uh, huge amounts of money to address the crisis. Uh, to this year, uh, when we, you know, the pandemic has started, we made all efforts to put in place some packages, packages to address the issue. But when it comes to climate, uh, we have been delaying, uh, but I think time for action is now. Uh, so we are no longer going to delay climate action. We need the similar kind of stimulus packages for financial crisis and uh, COVID-19 crisis. We need a similar one for climate action. And this is the kind of ambition we need moving towards COP26 next year. Thank you. Quite right, quite right. Now we have to bring this to a conclusion too, um, sadly, even though there are some questions that we haven't quite got to, uh, but we've publicly referred to them. There's, there's a questions about coal subsidies and I think it's pretty clear that, that, that those are unnecessary, harmful and, and need in some cases to be rather rapidly removed, removed. others uh, will take more time, but there's really no excuse for continuing to subsidize coal anymore. Uh, other questions on plastics, there's a very good report uh, ODI have produced recently on, on plastics and again the opportunity to do something both from an innovation point of view but also from a structural point of view in that. So thank you very much for all of you who have contributed both online and our wonderful panel. I'm going to try and bring this to some kind of conclusion with uh, limited time left and I'm going to suggest this. All of you have referred essentially to the necessity of a, of a system change, of a systems response to this problem that allows us to grapple with public health issues like the COVID problem, uh, the economic response to that and, and climate change. And, and without a systems approach, we're unlikely to be able to find solutions. And within that big system approach, there are of course systems within it, food systems, energy systems, transport, finance, natural systems that we need to value uh, in, in economic terms. We've also uh, acknowledged that it needs a multi-dimensional response. And in the context of, of exponential change in technology, which we'll have to harness, we'll have to take the benefit of that exponential shift and use it to deal with these interrelated problems. We can't feel too threatened by that change. We have to adopt, adapt and direct technologies towards these system changes that we need to make our economy green and more resilient. And, and if Kate Rayworth were on a call, you know, more donut shaped, 
but where we understand the limitations uh, are the physical boundaries that we have to work within, the cultural and social boundaries which, which should guide and direct our behaviours. But where, as uh, all of our speakers have pointed out, but maybe particularly Madhav, where there is an intergenerational element, where we have to take account of the generation most affected by the consequences of climate change and indeed the indebtedness that's flowing from our response to COVID and listen hard to their solutions, follow their instincts to fix this problem uh, in, in, uh, in time for their future prospects uh, to flourish and prosper. And that introduces us to a whole range of moral, legal and philosophical questions that need to be resolved about what sort of political and legal systems can adequately protect a, a whole generation that is threatened uh, by the failure to act on climate change by previous generations. Uh, we've learned of all sorts of specific interventions and one of the ways in which I would like to think ODI can contribute to the solution of these complex problems is to find data evidence analysis that's valuable at guiding and directing specific intervention points in these systems to give us opportunity to fix these problems in a productive and and uh, effective way so you know what specific interventions would work in food systems uh, what choices remain to policymakers to use their stimulus packages to re-engineer our energy system, so it's also part of our transportation system. Electric vehicles store power as well as use power. Uh, broadband, uh, which we could you know, bring in, in to all around the world to good effect, also helps us better manage energy demand. These interrelated infrastructure developments are all facilitated and enabled by other technology innovations, how renewable energy and storage and digital demand side management and electric vehicles are all technologies that can be mutually supportive, but they need the right regulatory framework, they need the right capital deployment, the right combination of public and private finance in order to be really effective. So I think we've had great presentations, we've got a conversation that hopefully will roll on and ODI will remain in the centre of those conversations and it find, I find it very attractive that in this particular moment we are able to combine New York Climate Week, which I miss, all the people that gather there, but people are gathering online, ODI's 60th anniversary Global Reset, and the Future Voices series, which allows those with the future ahead of them to feel as if they have a say in how that evolves. So thank you very much for all joining in and, uh, and, and have a good day.